everyone another episode of the innovators mindset podcast i got my good friend tom murray uh tom is someone i've known for years and actually interesting i actually don't even think i've been in the same place as tom more than three times i face to face but we've actually connected virtually uh for years and years and years have a very good friendship we actually just talked for an hour uh before this podcast just hanging out i think that's one of the things I've been doing with all the people that I connect with is just sitting down having conversations and not recording the whole thing. Uh, but Tom is also the author of Personal and Authentic. If you read the reviews, if you go look online, if you actually look at some of the things saying, this is really connecting with educators. And I'm very proud um, that we have actually uh, impressed, has published this book. And I'm also very proud because I made Tom write it. So I said, Tom, you need to write a book just with you. And so uh, I want to make sure, because I don't want you taking all the credit. I want a little bit. But, but reality, the reason I approached Tom uh, about it wasn't because I, because I wanted him to share anyone's ideas other than his, because I've seen him speak, I've seen him connect, and I knew that a lot of people don't get that opportunity. And so the ability to read his book um, really kind of captures the essence of who Tom is and what he believes. And so I know that it's connected with people. So Tom, thanks for being on the podcast today. Really excited to have you. It's awesome to be here, my friend. Thanks for the time to connect. I enjoyed connecting there as well. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. Yeah. Hey, Tom, can you tell like your, your journey? I know um, the work that you're doing now versus like where you started, kind of just share a little bit about your journey in education. Yeah, so I spent the first 15 years um, in a school district in Pennsylvania as an elementary teacher, a middle school teacher, a middle school principal, an elementary principal, went to district office my last couple of years there. I obviously couldn't keep a job, so like I went to work in DC, right? Makes total sense, right? So now I run something called Future Ready Schools, and so it's a national uh, bipartisan nonprofit. We work with thousands of schools across the country in different ways. Um, my heart's still in the classroom. You know, I love yeah. days of being able to connect with teachers, connect with principals. Uh, there's things I miss those days of being a principal and hanging out with the kindergarten, like those kinds of things. But now it's working on things in larger scales. So now it's working around things, you know, with, or, with the FCC um, from a pol political end, supporting students without access at home or whatever the case might be. But, you know, no matter where I go, there's amazing people working hard for kids. And so it's an honor to do what I do. Hey, so Tom, I'm going to challenge you a little bit right away. When, when does future ready schools just become ready? When we ready get to that yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Is it just ready? No, and it's funny that you say that because originally people were like, well, we're not even ready now. What about the future? And so we really frame it of what is it that our kids need for their future and not look at it from an adult end. So if we look at it from an adult end, it's this, this mindset of like, well, you know, we're preparing for something. And when we look at it from this kid end, it's really focused on what do kids really need for the future? What are the type of learning experiences? And then how do we create schools that can actually do that? And so we try and amplify the awesome things that are happening from coast to coast, try and break some of the barriers, but also eliminate some of the excuses. You know, so many times we've got schoolers or districts saying like, well, we could never do that. And yet there's a district, you know, an hour away with less budget, High, like more, you know, more of a, of a challenging population or whatever the case might be, and they're crushing it. And so help really amplify some of those positive pieces. But you're right. It's working to do it right now for our kids. Because here's the thing. When we look at things like visioning, we look at things like, you know, preparing kids for their future. If, if I'm a senior, if I'm a, a, you know, a high school freshman, I don't care that it's going to take four or five years because I'm out. So what are we doing right now to meet mm -hmm. kids' needs is certainly at the forefront. So like, what are you seeing because you, you get the one of the really compelling opportunities that you have and I have is that we get to see multiple schools, right? And and so one of the things that I know that you and I both miss is, you know, building those relationships with the same people every day. But I think a lot of times you have that opportunity when you do some of the work that we do to see so many different schools and see from that process. And with all the stuff with like COVID-19, coronavirus stuff happening, what have you seen about the schools that are, I don't know if I don't know if I want to say handling this well, but are, and I don't even know if I could say the term better prepared because nobody was like, hey, what if a pande pandemic happens, right? Like nobody was like, just in case, right? But, but what have you seen has been like the schools that have been able to more yep. effectively work through this time and, and to, to better serve students? What are some of the things that they're doing? 
Yeah, so I would say that I would argue that, yes, some schools were far more prepared because they were focused on some of the right things. One of the things that's been, you know, front and center in this is around equity, around equity and opportunity and access. You know, what's fascinating from the United States end is we've got districts that have put their hand up and said, like, we can't do anything. We're basically done for the year. You know, we're kind of good luck. We've got others that have said, like, overnight, now we're going to do these, like, we're basically just transitioning from in-person to remote learning. You're following the same schedule. And there's this entire continuum of where districts are. But districts that had and prioritized, you know, access for students, whether they were devices, prioritized access at home you know when i see a lot of districts saying now like do you have a device do you have computer like do you have access at home there is districts doing that five years ago so here's the flip side to that if all of a sudden we care about things like access at home let's say in the fall theoretically we go back to a normal situation are we not going to care about the access at home are we not going to care about the hot spots are we not going to care about the opportunities and so we can't say it's important now but in the fall be like just kidding we've got to bring all that stuff back when the gaps are still there. And so um, some districts absolutely were more prepared. What's funny, George, is I, you know, I, in part of my, my time back in the district, we started a full virtual program in K-12 in our public school for digital, full. we call them cyber back in the program. That was 10 years ago. And so it was, I heard, I recently heard it was a, a big time name in the United States politically saying like, this is the dawn of digital learning. And I want it to be like, have you live under a rock? Right. Because like districts have been doing this for a long, long time. What hasn't been fair in a lot of regards is the flip overnight to say like, take everything you've always done. Now on Monday, you've got to do it all virtually and online. That puts people in a really bad spot. But the flip side, we can't say, well, we're going to take six months to figure this out. Because again, our kids, they need the opportunity right now. So, okay. And I think, because this is something I've been advocating for, for a long time. And the, the opportunities that a kid has when they have access to this device. And the analogy that I always use, if I was a new principal to your school and I said, you know what? Libraries obsolete, not a big thing. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to actually take the library out and we're going to repurpose it because you know, kids have books at home, right? They could do that there. People would be like, "I I wouldn't last a week, right? I'd be fired right away. But then you have a kid who brings a device in their hand that has the library of the entire world. And then we say, no, you can't bring that in here. And like with no, there's no push against it. There's nothing. And so a lot of our kids who do have access seem to be elevated in their opportunities. But then some of the kids who only have access, you know, maybe for a couple classes of school have lost out. And what I've been saying for a long time, and you will know this better because of the role that you do. And you can clarify if I'm out to lunch or accurate here is I actually believe that every school in north america could ensure that every kid had access to a device and they could do it within their budget without any grants like i'm talking a chromebook i'm not talking necessarily a macbook air but it would take some reprioritizing of where we spend our money right so a really simple thing if you have every kid to have access to the device i already know right away your paper budget should not be the same right so i don't and maybe i'm crazy by saying that it will take some thought it's not like you just do it like this but it will take some thought and repurposing. Like when I bring that up, is that crazy to say, or do you see that's a possibility? Well, I mean, the financial issues of it are absolutely real, but what I would say is you are seeing that a lot of times. And, you know, I know for both of us, we work with school and district leaders all over the place. And I'll often ask when we're talking about infrastructure devices, like how many of you are one-to-one and the vast majority of places I go, even where there's, there's poverty, you know, we'll see a large amounts of them in that case that, that have that connectivity in those devices. When you look at the cost of a Chromebook right now being less than the cost of a biology textbook, you really have to analyze some of that. So it's part of the reason, you know, and, and, the past couple of years in the United States, this whole like go open concept around curriculum that's um, you can use in so many different ways that it's free and it's open in that regard to alter and to change, as opposed to purchasing curriculum that costs sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars to do exactly what you're saying. It's the device plus curriculum plus, you know, it's not an either or an and and. And it's funny that you mentioned that. One of the things that I'll often do when I work with district leadership teams, especially if I'm there for multiple days, is we'll start to prioritize and I'll say, pull your technology budget for the last three years pull your budget for your paper your toner and your copiers for the past three years and more often than not what we actually see is they both go up 
which right. can also be indicative of, because really what this boils down to is the instructional practice, the, the pedagogy right. end. It's not just the access. And that really can be indicative of like, I do everything I've always done. Here's the worksheets, hand these out. We've got 10 minutes left, hop on the Chromebooks. Like if we're doing it for that reason, don't buy them because it is a waste of money in that regard. And that's why the pedagogy piece, I, I have to tell you, at least, and you probably get this too, but at least once a month, it literally this time of year, it's probably once a week where districts are doing their budget and they're planning. I will get an email from a principal that says something along this, and you could change the numbers based on the side of the district. Hey, Tom, lat, uh, four years ago, we went one-to-one. -one. We're looking at refreshing in the fall. It's going to cost $1.6 million. Our board, since it's budget season, is ad analyzing. In the past four years, our scores, and we could talk about that, mm -hmm. obviously, our scores haven't increased much in the past four years. So our, our board is saying, you know, if, um, why are we buying these devices again if not a whole lot has changed? And that shows, like, the access and the opportunity is one part of the conversation. But if we don't shift what we do with right. it and just digitize what we've done, like, it's, it's not worth the money. And that's that's where it's the explore, the design, the create from a research end that's really important. And so I think it's both here. Like one of the things turning it back to remote, remote learning is it's really, and I saw, you know, our good friend AJ Giuliani put down on paper exactly what um, I know a lot of us are thinking of like, this isn't really distance learning on the whole by any means. It's really like emergency learning at yeah. this point, because, you know, a lot of what we're getting right now is going to be that natural first step. And just to share that for a moment, you know, when I ran that full-time virtual program for three years, the natural tendency to move to online was kind of like, here's my notes, here's my slides, read this, answer these questions, turn that back in, which is that first kind of baby step but there's really not a teaching component there. And so when you talk about actual distance learning, there's really, really um, deeper pieces related to instruction and what it can look like. But right now, I mean, teachers understandably so are trying to do the best that they can trying to get by, but that it's a really delicate conversation that's very deep in, in terms of access, opportunity, pedagogy, um, in so many different realms there. Yeah, because if you're looking straight at, you know, <clears throat> did getting these devices lead to increased test scores? And, the thing I say, the research actually points to this over and over again, is that actually um, getting devices doesn't do anything for test scores. Mm -hmm. But did, and like, as you said, did the way we teach and learn change? Like, did we change, say like, hey, let's look at how we're doing things different, or are we just like putting our notes that we put on a board now in a Google Doc and then just doing everything the same, right? And really it's what changes because of those devices, like what will happen uh, with the shift. And I think, you know, I'm not trying to downplay that, you know, obviously some school districts and areas um, have less funding uh, in North America or in the United States is way more tied to property taxes than it is in Canada. So for example, in Alberta, every kid grade one, no matter where you go to school actually gets the same amount of funding for school, which I know is not the same, you know, right. in, in, the United, in the United States, you know, based on the state. But we as leaders, I think the notion of future ready is adapting to some of the things that we have in front of us and figuring out a way. And so like one of the things I used to do as a principal, we led, I had my staff lead the professional learning for our school. We saved a ton of money through that process, but it wasn't like, hey, how could we cut costs? It's like, okay, if I actually could tap into the leadership of my school, have people across the hallway see value of our own staff and save money through this process, there's a huge amount of value that I could get here that goes beyond just trying to cut costs. But like a lot of times, and like I get brought in, you get brought in to work with districts. And I think it's really great to have people with different perspectives. But then when we don't actually develop the leadership within our schools, there's a huge lost opportunity. So let me give you two things that reinforce exactly what you're talking about that I think people look at as positives that I see complete as negatives. One, social media. Two, administrative and, and supervision. Let me, let me tell you what I'm talking about. How many times on social media you'll be scrolling through Twitter and somebody's saying like, here's a game changing app. Right. And so much of the, so many of the tools, and listen, there's a lot of great tools and resources out there, but from a pedagogy end, so many of them, if not the majority of them are very, very low level stuff. It's why when you look at global reports around things like the OECD report, every couple of years that comes out and it basically studies the amount that's spent in technology and the, the, the scores related to learning. And we could certainly dive into the, the scores part of it. And, and I know you and I would agree on, yeah. on looking at using that as a metric, but the, the, the headlines always come out and they're like something along the lines of, 
you know, more technology in classrooms doesn't mean higher level of learning. I want to write the op-ed next time that says like, thanks, Captain Obvious, because if we're just digitizing all of this stuff, right. like we haven't shifted anything. And social media reinforces that. Let me tell you how administrators often reinforce that without realizing it. You see, it's all well-intended stuff. The teacher might have the mindset of like, oh, we're going to get them on the computers. We're going to use digital tools. But if we're using it for low level recall based mm -hmm. stuff, the more time we spend on that, the more time we spend on lower level learning. Here's from an administrator and what often happens. District goes one to one. So the board, the school, like the board wants to see the use of the devices that they invested in. You can understand that. So mm -hmm. that gets passed down. So the principal and the superintendent put the pressure on teachers to use it. You gotta use it X amount of times or kids should be doing it this way or this way. So then we put it in and kids have the devices and then look at our, from an administrative end supervision, look at our walkthrough forms. You get the a quick little five minute walkthrough form. Nothing wrong with that. You walk in and one of the things on it is students are leveraging technology. Check. Yeah. Here's my pushback. So what? Yeah. So what? And how many times is it the, hey, kids were using Google Docs. Check. Kids were using the devices. Check. There's nothing that I just referenced that talks about deeper levels of learning. Yeah. And here's the thing, like you can be 100% engaged, 100% using digital content, 100% using devices, 100% of the time and 100% low level learning and it gets glorified on social media every day. Yeah. Well, the, the, even, even just being thoughtful of like, there's, there's this, I, I wrote this blog post years ago about um, they're saying like in college, it is proven that if you write notes and as opposed to uh, using a laptop to do this, your memorization of content is actually much better writing notes. Okay, great. Understood is the purpose to memorize or is it the purpose to understand? And so if it's lecture style and it's just that, I'm not against lecture, um, but what they're talking about there, they're not necessarily talking about even learning, but they've just used the term memorization in lieu of learning as opposed to like, so yeah, okay. So if I write the notes of what you're saying, I can regurgitate it back to you. It doesn't mean I understand it. And I think the thing that you and I are talking about that's really important is I always say this, if you focus on deep understanding of learning, of what you're doing, you're gonna memorize it. But if you get kids to memorize stuff, it doesn't mean you understand it. Yeah. And there's a real big difference between the two. And like, I'm really thoughtful when I read research about this stuff, because you know, people say, oh, the research says, I'm like, yeah, the research is memorization. It doesn't actually say you're learning, or it only shows like grades have, you know, uh, scores have gone up. And we know that's a metric that we use. But it's not the only metric of understanding because a lot of kids will actually be able to regurgitate something on a test, get the mark that they need to get, then they won't remember it two weeks later. And so, yeah, we did what we needed to do to, to do well on the test, but we actually haven't really helped the kid to become a really great learner. You know, this is where it hit me. You know, I, I just pushed administrators and I'm, I'm speaking to colleagues when I say that, but it was actually an administrator that changed my mindset on this. So I was one to one in my classroom 20 years ago one-to-one -one Palm Pilots. Remember those things, right? Mm -hmm. Palm Pilots. Did so you have like a little and, and and stuff? I mean, like when they went color, those things were legit. <laughs> and in all seriousness, I, I heard yeah. somebody one time tell me like, those things are going to be a game changer in education, right? right? I'm like still waiting to see that. So like the quick story, and I tell this in personal and authentic, there I was a second year teacher. We were not a wealthy district by any means. We were piloting them. We had gotten a grant. So I get 25 Palm Pilots from my kids teaching fourth grade at the time. And so I'm preparing this lesson. My principal's doing an observation the next week. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to impress them. I'm going to use technology the whole time. Kids are going to be used Palm Pilots. So don't laugh. He wanted to see, it was a, we had a spelling block 20 years ago. It was a 30 mm -hmm. minutes spelling block is what he wanted to see. So I'm thinking to myself like, all right, I'm going to crush this. So here's what I have them do. First couple of minutes, kids are kind of reviewing. We're pulling out the Palm Pilots. We use this program called Graffiti, right? right. And so kids, and they each, hey, 20 years ago, they had their own individualized spelling list. I was proud of that, right? So we partnered them up. And basically what they did is like, you would tell me my word, you'd read it and I'd have to write it and I'd beam it back to you. You'd check my word. Yep, you got it right. You'd, I'd give you a word. So hear me out for a minute. So in this 25 minutes, we did a quick review. Every child was engaged the entire time. 
every piece of te the technology was used 100% of the time. Every time I asked, her, asked a question, every single hand went up. And so I'm thinking to myself as a brand new, like 23 year old teacher, 22 year old teacher, like I'm crushing it. I'm so glad my principal is here. Like I am modeling, like this is how a lesson with technology is done, right? Like I hope you keep this in mind principal because this is what it's like. Every kid was engaged. And my lesson plan to like the 30 seconds was followed right. So the next day I, I remember there I was walking down to my principal's office. Now I would tell you, my principal was awesome. He valued relationships. He pushed us to take risks. You know, in your mind, like what you wrote about in the innovator's mindset, so many of those qualities mm -hmm. he really, really took. But I will tell you, just like you would, he pushed. It wasn't just the celebrate the, the fluff. Right. It was boiling down. So I sit down in his office side by side and he looks at me and we've all heard, every educator's heard, he smiles and said, so Tom, how do you think the lesson went? And I looked across the table. And I was like, Bill, I got to be honest. I, I think it went pretty well. Like kids were engaged the whole time. I used technology right. the entire time. Uh, a kid, you know, every hand went up, went through it. My lesson plan was followed. And I sit back and I'm like, all right, I'm thinking to myself, bring it. Tell me how great it was. Just tell me how great it was. And he, <laughs> he says, uh, and I say that obviously tongue in cheek, but like, I remember thinking like, I crushed this. Like all the things right. that we would learn in teacher school were in yep. place. Yep. And so he smiles and he says, so here's my first question for you. What were your learning objectives? And I said, well, we wanted to use the Palm Pilots to be able to, and I still remember he stopped. He's like, no, stop. What were your learning objectives? And I'm like, you just cut me off, right? Like yeah. we wanted to use the Palm Pilots to be able to, and he's like, Tom, every time I ask you about learning, you start talking about the technology tool. Right. He said this, he said, Tom, if you took the Palm Pilot out of the equation, paired them up side by side, pencil and paper, had them do the exact same thing, could you have done it in seven or eight minutes that it took 25 minutes to do? Yeah. Yep. And I'll tell you, it fundamentally shift how I use technology because I, and granted, we had that relationship. He could push me instructionally. I didn't leave with my heart ripped out. Like we talked about what we could do to like make it deeper in nature. And, you know, it was that moment in time from a great instructional supervision conversation, having that relationship that challenged me of like, if we're using technology for technology's sake, or in that case, I had planned the lesson just because the tech could do something, mm -hmm. not because it was the best way to learn something. And 20 years later, it's still so prevalent. Like we're doing something because the tech can, not by evaluating like this is the best way to learn it. So there's a time where like shut the Chromebook off and get them up and they're hands on or whatever. or maybe it's more project based and the technology's at the end where they're explore whatever the case might be. And so it's really important that we don't get caught up in sometimes what we see on social media. That's really just glorifying lots of low level stuff. Yeah, and I think this is always the thing that I struggle and wrestle with in my head is that I really believe technology is transformational but only if we use it in a transformational way, right? So in, in I, I've always, I've kind of challenged the SAMR model. I'm sure people listening, you know, are familiar with the SAMR model. Yep. Cause I think really when I talk about the idea of transformational, it has to be transformational to the kid. So yep. for example, um, lowest level substitute, um, you know, or like, well, you know, the kid, you gave that kid an iPad, but now, and they're reading on it or they're writing on it, but they could have done that with a notebook. I'm like, but the kid, actually wasn't reading and writing on the device on a piece of paper before. So now this is transformational to the child. Whereas like we're saying oh, at the highest end is redefinition. All this kid is like making videos and doing all this stuff in class. Well, that kid is actually uh, has a million followers on TikTok and they already know how to make videos. Like it might be trans like it might be redefinition to you, but not necessarily to the child. So it's really thinking about how do we use technology in a transformational way according to the kids in front of us. And really, that's where I talk about the idea of personalization of learning. Not, you know, we talk about personalization, but we often standardize how we assess, you know, what we do. So really kind of think about that. But I want to talk to you uh, now about something, a story from your book. And um, I actually, with uh, Impress, what we do, we actually read all the books and give feedback as the authors are writing. We have kind of like an educator eye. And then we take it to an, uh, like a, an editor that goes through all the stuff that I could, I don't know what a prepositional phrase is. I don't know any of that, those things. I, the thing with Tom's book, I couldn't read it all in one sitting because I would like cry. And I'm like, okay, I, I, gotta just, I, I can't do this anymore. And there's a story about at the beginning you share about um, uh, your, your, I think it was your like mentor teacher is the first year teacher had a huge impact. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and I'll honestly say it, it's it's still hard 20 years later to talk about it without getting emotional. 
Um, and so my mentor teacher, a gentleman by the name of, of Mark Weeder, 26 year veteran teacher, you know, I, I often joke when I speak, I still tell the story. I wrote it in personal authentic, like literally my first day teaching, I was 21 years old. Mark was right across the hall and he was the exact kind of teacher that all kids wanted, all kids wanted. And I knew that because I swear every kid walked into my room in fourth grade, looked across the hall and kind of mumbled <laughs> like, man, I really wish I had Mr. Weeder this year and kind of walked in. And, and I will tell you, like he just, he Kids would run to him like the relational piece like that I learned so much about just loving and caring about about kids and on my first day I was so blessed to have him as my mentor on my very first day before the very first bell rang I've got a picture of it to this day and I get chills talking about it and I treasure the picture because he put his arm around me and he said so Tom is your mentor you know I've been doing this for 26 years if there's one thing that I can teach you it's that this work is about loving and caring about kids everything else is secondary to that. And Tom, mm-hmm. if you lose sight of that, I'll give you two options. One, just get the heck out and go do something different to get somebody in here that can love and care about kids. Or number two, refocus on it because like the kids that are about to walk down this hall, they need you. And he, he said that in those moments before that bell rang. But I will tell you, in my first year, I really struggled. And part of it was like I was green. I was brand new. It was not, I had a, I had a challenging class, but it also, <laughs> like I also, I'd just been getting started. So I'm sure I wasn't the best with things like classroom management and those things. And I will tell you at one point, so I really, I would watch kids run to him at the end of the day. I would watch kid people come back years later. I remember this one time in particular, I literally can still see it 20 years later. And I saw this husband and wife walking down the hall and they were holding the baby. And I, I made the assumption because I was going back to sit at my desk. It was after school. And I made the assumption that it was just the parents of one of his kids. Didn't think of anything of it. I sit down, I'm after my desk, try and catch up. And here's what I hear. I hear him step into the back of Mark's room because it was right across the wall. Our, our, our doors were parallel. And he said, Mr. Weeder, Mr. Weeder, do you remember me? I'm Sam. I had you 22. It was 22 years ago. And I'm thinking, man, like this guy had him like when I was like literally like when I was born and I hear Sam and, and Mark comes running over to him before he gives him a big hug. I hear the husband turns to his wife and says, honey, that's the teacher I've always told you about that's him. That's Mr. Weeder. And I remember thinking there I was 21 years old early in my literally had been a teacher for a month. And I remember feeling like, will that ever be me? Like, will will kids ever want to come back and see me? Like, will kids ever want to come back years later? Because then it was Mr. Weeder. I I wanted to introduce you to our baby because, you know, and and we're home for the weekend for for, um, a holiday. I think it was right around Thanksgiving time. And, And when we look at that, I just saw the impact of like, man, the impact of a teacher to want to come back decades later to say hello shows that long lasting impact. And I'll tell you, you know, one of the things in really struggling, the, what I loved about Mark in respect is he carried such a way with him that he called me out when I was acting like an idiot. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that I think sometimes we do as teachers is we look the other way when we've got a colleague that's just like not representing the profession well or not being professional because it's nobody really engages like likes that conflict right mm-hmm. and so I, I um it was it was October of my very first year and I'll tell you I was having a, a, t- a tough day with this one student and I I will be totally vulnerable and say I, I lost it I walked down to the faculty room and I like hit my hand on the desk and I'm like this kid's not getting it he doesn't understand I'm so tired I call home every day nobody ever get like calls me back and I went on and on and on and I hit my hand on the desk I got up and I walked out and my mentor left his lunch on the table and he opened up the door and he followed me down to my room and I I didn't know that at that point in time so I sat in my room and I was so frustrated having a bad day lost it in front of all my colleagues and my mentor opens the door he walks over to me looks at me man to man he said Tom don't you ever 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 do that again And I remember being kind of taken back. And he's like, you want to get through to this kid? You've got to love this kid and care about this kid. And he went on and he was like, you know, you're talking about calling home. When's the last time you told home about something positive? If all you're doing is call home about negative, like what if you picked up the phone and just found one positive? Maybe they would call you back. And I will tell you, he was tough on me, but you know what? I needed it. So and having that relationship and and calling me out there. And as we went longer, I, I would watch how how he interacted with students. You know, kids laughed in his class. They had fun, but he had really high expectations. His kids performed. And so it was the spring of, of, of that coming year. And, and you know, I, I be honest, as a first year teacher, I wanted to be like him. I thought my career, like, man, if I could do it and be his love, that, that was a goal of mine. 
Um, but my mentor was was just before uh, Easter break. I, we stood in the hallway, and he was he had just purchased this brand new RV, this trailer he had gotten the night before. And he's flipping through, and he's showing me the pictures. And he's like, "So Tom, check it out. Our bed's back here, and check it out. There's a little grill. We can put the grill back here." And Tom, we picked it up yesterday. And Rayanne, his wife, Rayanne, and I are going to go down to Western Maryland. We're going to watch Mark Jr. play tennis tomorrow. We're so excited. I'm like, "Ah, right, Mark, have a good. I'll see you on Tuesday, man. Have a good time." And it was. It was <laughs> It was the last time I saw him, you know, and, and you look at the, the next day I, I walk out and I see, I told you, man, I'm not an emotional guy, but I, I get emotional talking about it because you relive these kinds of experiences, right. right? So the next day I go, I go down to my mailbox and I pull the mailbox out. I pull out my newspaper and I open it up and, and how I found out was it was the front cover. It was this brand new RV that had been rolled over on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And, and in that moment, you know, like the moment and right now with like coronavirus and all the, the things that happen, like tragedy, like it stops and it pauses you, you know? And so I'm so blessed to have a mentor that like his impact was so great and so vast that literally like I challenge myself this day to be one ounce of the professional and the mm -hmm. impact that he had. George, 4,000 people paid respects at my mentor's funeral, 4,000. Mm -hmm. And so for teachers that have the mindset of like, well, I'm just a teacher, like, no, that's nonsense because you've got just the right opportunity every stinking day to change the lives of kids and the greatest ones, you know what they do? Like, that's exactly what they do. And so when I think about my mentor and it sets the tone in personal and authentic that this work at the end of the day is not about us. It is so easy in our work, George, to be like, well, if she would, if my principal would, if he would, if he would do that, like it's so much harder to be like, what's my role? What's my mindset? And I'm so glad I had a colleague to kind of slap me upside the head to put me in my place and say, Tom, like, we don't act like that here. This is not about you. I'm so glad I am blessed to have a mentor that, that helped me with that. But it's how I kick off personal authentic. Cause for me, it wasn't just changing my educational thoughts. That was a fundamental life change in that regard. Mm -hmm. And I'm so blessed to have a teacher who is the heart and soul of our school that I could learn from for the first few months of my career. That's really an amazing story, Tom. And I want I'm glad you shared it. Just so you know, everyone cries on my podcast for some reason. So I, yeah, I guess you be, have that effect on people. I don't know. Yeah. Like I try to <laughs> dig into yeah. that but. but you know you know george i'm not and, and it's funny because i i think like you know when i when i speak i the i, I tell that story occasionally really in depth and, <laughs> and act pieces out from that yeah. just reliving it and i get emotional every single time yeah. on stage as the hundreds of time that i've taught it but it shows how real the work that we do every day with kids it shows how real the attachment to our colleagues are it shows how real the relationships to our students are yeah. and that this isn't just that idea of a job it's really when we look at it it's like our impact is vast yeah and i i i wrote about this and there's two things i really as i'm listening to you really kind of stuck out to me and i, I wrote about this too is that never doubt the impact you can have on a colleague because I think we're always waiting for the admin to yep. change the teacher or to this, right? It's uh, like, I, I talked about in Innovate Inside the Box, like a conversation I had with a colleague that forever changed the way that I taught. And it is really, a lot of times we say, oh, like the government doesn't know what they do. Why are they giving us advice? But then we say, well, we, I can't change anything because I'm just a teacher. I'm like, well, you just said the government has no impact because they don't know what you do. So why not? Why are you not that person for the person across the hall? The second thing I want to point out, and I think really, um, really stuck out to me is that a great teacher's legacy doesn't just live in kids, right? It also lives in their colleagues and the impact and, and your mentor obviously still lives in the, the, the stories that you share and the stories that students share that impact. And so I appreciate you sharing that. And um, we're, we're about to finish up, but Tom, this is the question. I've been asking everyone uh, that I've been doing this podcast because I really started doing the interview process when all this stuff with the coronavirus happened. What is like the, the like really short and sweet best advice you can give to, uh, to educators right now? So, you know, it's funny because in, in running a, a future ready podcast, I asked that exact same question because there's so probably many took it from me. right now. You probably took it from me. <laughs> that's it. That's I know it. you're I like waiting it. on, you're Gotta waiting see what George the does. I'm you're, scared, like, right? you're waiting for the update on the phone. <laughs> that's right. Wait you're like one it. of the three people that listens <laughs> and you're like, I, what did George say? I'm taking yeah. that question and saying, what? That was right, mine the whole right, time. Right. I'm just, yeah. Easy. So, so without, I mean, honestly, like the one thing I would point top of the list is 
see the entire child for who they are. You know, one of the things that I wrote about in Personal Authentic is the, uh, like the hidden stories within. And taking a look, it's so easy to just look at data points and test scores or talk about technology or access, but let's first and foremost put the child at the front and center. And I know that's a viewpoint you've always had, a mindset yeah. that you've always had, you know, but it's in, in the midst of all these pieces, if we're doing our best every single day for all that we can, and we look at it and those students that like, I, I, was, I was meeting with assistant principals yesterday and they're like, what do we do at a high school where for a week and a half, child hasn't logged in, child hasn't done anything. What, it's so easy to get fired up and to take it personal and yeah. to put the blame and they don't care, their parents don't care. But sometimes we need to just step back. What's the story there? Why isn't the case? Mm -hmm. You know, why, why aren't they doing that? And so it's looking at the social emotional part, making personal connections right now, being there for kids. What's fascinating to me about our time period right now with coronavirus is every single child that's in our educational systems around the world will remember this moment in their mm -hmm. life for yep. decades to come, which also means for educators, that's a heck of an opportunity because kids are gonna associate you with this period of time and so what is it that they're gonna remember 30 years from now? Maybe it's that quick phone call home of, hey, I'm just checking in, you doing okay? You know, I'm just checking in, hey, how, how's your family doing? You guys need anything? Those kinds of things. And it's so keeping those personal connections at the forefront, keeping the relationships at the heart and soul of what we do, and then taking those students that were on our radar that we were worried about, especially prior to not seeing them in person every day, and going out of our way to do whatever we can to connect with them, to connect with their families. So first and foremost, that they can feel that we love and care about them, and we'll do whatever we can to help them be successful. As I'm listening, really, a lot of times, and I've been sharing the same thing, if you focus on the stuff, you can lose the kid. But if you focus on the kid, don't, the stuff will get done, right? And I think that's, I think it's always starting from there. So I just wanna thank you, Tom. I know that uh, people really resonate with your message uh, and it's that really the heart and soul of what we do. If you have not read Personal Authentic, I highly suggest it, uh, obviously, but I'm biased because we did publish it, but I'll tell you, uh, I. We, we approached Tom about writing this because we knew he had such a powerful message and I'm really proud um, to, to have this in our lineup. It's an amazing book and I know people are really resonating with this. Tom, thank you for so much for being here. Uh, make sure that uh, if, you, if you're looking for the book, I put it in the links, uh, whether it's on YouTube or um, on the podcast. Tom, thanks so much. I hope you and your family are doing well during this time and uh, thanks for all you do for educators. Thanks, my friend. Thanks for having me. Okay. Take care, brother.